Good morning, good afternoon, everybody, wherever you might be. It is my great pleasure to welcome Laura Manchinska from the University of Copenhagen. And uh, she will entangle us in some quantum games and graph isomorphisms. Laura, the floor is yours. Take it away. Um, thank you. you. Yeah, thank you, Piotr, for the nice introduction. It's my pleasure uh, to talk to you guys. Um, and I'm my goal is to keep everyone with me throughout the 90 minutes. So if you are not following something, please do stop me and ask questions at any point. I will be more than happy to answer. All right. So this is my plan. Um, to, to give you a little bit of background, so my area of um, research is quantum information and computing. So what I want to do in the first part um, is to kind of tell you what this quantum computing is all about. What are the major goals? What are the ideas right, uh, in this field? And then we're gonna see entanglement and non-local games. So entanglement is a uh, basic concept uh, in quantum mechanics and quantum computing. Um, it's a resource uh, for, for getting quantum speed ups and advantages. And we can study entanglement. We're gonna see this uh, using non-local games. So that's kind of the first part. We're gonna try to keep things pretty high level and just to kind of provide you with the context of these mathematical problems that we'll be looking at later on. And then in the second part, uh, I'm gonna talk about, introduce this notion of uh, quantum isomorphismal graphs. So this will be some quantum or non-commutative analog of uh, usual graph isomorphism. Okay, and maybe kind of what I want to convince you of is that sort of um, quantum computing provides a rich ground for um, really nice problems in non-commutative mathematics. And a lot of them are actually quite hard. So if you're looking for an extra challenge, here it is. Okay, but let's start with this kind of uh, high level motivation of what is quantum computing all about. Uh, so if you are thinking uh, of uh, doing some sort of computation, so you have some data and you wanna manipulate it in some way, right? Now to do so, you must write down your data on some physical medium. And then the ways in which you can uh, manipulate your data is somehow tied to the laws of physics that govern that medium of your choice, right? So now we know if we look at very small scales, then the nature follows laws of quantum mechanics. So this is the idea of quantum computing to kind of use these uh, laws of quantum mechanics, but for the purpose of quantum information processing, right? And this was first suggested, for example, by Feynman and some um, other people. Um, so kind of the difference between quantum computing and information and say quantum mechanics is in its approach. So in quantum computing, we are really looking to harness these quantum mechanical effects in order to process information in ways that are not accessible to classical technologies. So what kind of things uh, might we be looking for? Well, uh, we could ask for more secure crypto systems uh, for faster algorithms, right? So even for our classical problems, we might want to find a quantum algorithm that solves a certain problem, a classical problem faster than any known classical algorithms. Or we might be looking for improvement for communication. So you have some communication channel and you are using, uh, looking to use it kind of more efficiently using quantum resources. Okay, to, uh, I want to mention only two kind of hallmark early examples of such quantum advantages or quantum protocols with no classical analogs. So the first one uh, is due to Bennett and Brassard and it is this existence of unconditionally secure communication channel. So here we have Alice and Bob and Alice wants to send some classical information to Bob. But now they're worried that someone uh, could be listening in on this information that they are sending, it's, it's top secret, right? And they would wanna know whether or not someone did listen in. Now, classically, it is provably impossible to achieve this uh, cryptographic primitive. But it turns out if you encode these classical bits that Alice wants to send to Bob into quantum states, such as polarization of the photon, then you are uh, able to detect any potential eavesdropping with high, uh, with high probability, if it did take place. And kind of um, 
physical principle at play here is that if you are trying to observe an unknown quantum system, then you end up uh, disturbing it with high probability. Okay. Uh, now, the second protocol I want to mention is Shor's um, factorization algorithm. So this lets us factor integers in polynomial time on a quantum computer. Okay, so this is a classical problem, and for it, we provide a quantum algorithm. And the uh, relevance, so we don't know any polynomial time uh, classical algorithm for achieving this task. We don't know, for all we know, right, uh, p is equal to np, and uh, all these um, problems have polynomial uh, time algorithms. Um, but um, actually, it is believed that there, there is such a classical algorithm does not exist. And as an evidence for that, right, uh, there exist these crypto systems, um, say RSA, um, that uh, are probably used if you just go online and try to buy something with your credit card, then it's probably secured um, by RSA, at least for now. Uh, so this RSA, its security relies on the assumption that factoring uh, large integers is a computationally expensive problem. Okay, so classically, with existing computers, we don't know how to do it, but if we had a large scale quantum computer, this would not be a computationally expensive problem. Um, all right, but so now we've seen some of these quantum advantages and you might wonder where do they come from, right? What, what is the reason? Perhaps this is a somewhat philosophical and, uh, question, but uh, people are writing papers and trying to uh, answer this. And well, we don't know that we cannot pin down precisely where this quantum advantage comes from. But two things that people, like two words that you would hear mentioned uh, is quantum superposition and entanglement. So let me briefly try to give you an idea of what they are. So you could think uh, of quantum superposition as some uh, complex valued analog of a probability distribution. Okay, so in quantum mechanics, uh, if your system can be in one uh, in two states, so uh, such as what maybe your uh, computer's memory could be in state zero, like bit zero uh, or bit one, um, then it can also be in what's called a superposition um, between these two states. And such a superposition would be characterized by two complex numbers, alpha and beta. We call them amplitudes, and the requirement. Uh, is, is this one, this normalization, right? That uh, the, uh, the square of, of the modulus of A plus the square of the modulus B is equal to one. Uh, and such a superposition between uh, two orthogonal states would, would then uh, be referred to as the basic kind of uh, info quantum information carrier unit or one qubit, just like uh, on a classical computer, you would have a bit. Right, and uh, now if you had n such qubits, uh, then the state of, of this uh, n qubit memory would be uh, would be described by uh, an arbitrary superposition over all uh, length n bit strings. Okay, so there are two to the n bit strings of length n. Right, so we need uh, exponentially many of these amplitudes, so we can. So um, we often think, right, uh, we would think of this uh, one qubit uh, of these two amplitudes as actually being uh, a unit vector in space C2, okay? And then, uh, then this uh, n qubit state would be some unit vector um, in this n-fold tensor product of these uh, uh, spaces C2. May I ask a question? Yes, of course. So I've always wondered, like, I mean, like, so when talking about superpositions in quantum mechanics, Yes. Uh, why is this different from classical mechanics? I mean, for me, like a superposition would be just like uh, choosing another basis, like the rotation in C2. Um, but I mean, you could in principle also do so in classical mechanics, right? I'm like choosing a state and choosing a different basis, like uh, I'm like rotation, like in... You, you mean, it, are you talking about kind of probabilistic processes where they are really no, probabilities? Uh, I'm talking about like that this state is just like a, like, how do you say, a fixed state. I mean, like it's a, it's an, it's a vector in C2, right? Mm -hmm. And um, so saying that this is like a superposition um, doesn't, for me, like mathematically, like it's not different from just a state zero or just a state one. It's just a rotation in C2. 
it's more about right. the available state space that, that we have and also how it behaves under these tensor products, right? So if you think like your one qubit is kind of like a, a polarization of a photon or something like that, right? Now, when you have N photons, the way that this scales is exponential, right? Like you, you your vector, like it seems like you just have N systems, right? Like like, they, like normally I just have N bits, but then, then this dimension scales exponentially. I mean, but I, could do, but I could do the same classically, you no? Know? Like, I mean, you, I, I could just say- With an exponential state, effort. Like I could just say, I take a classical system, which consists of uh, like, how to say, like a two dimensional classical system. You know, like, Alex, it's not two dimensional. You would have to look at it to the three sphere, right? All possible directions spanned by two vectors. Yeah. It too, in fact, corresponds to uh, the uh, state space consisting uh, of, from two points, yes, pure state. Yes, yes. Just two points, not, not uh, something which is two dimensional, but something which is finite, yes. So, I mean, I, I can think of any qubit state as a as a vector in 2D, right? But I could, if I have this polarization of photon, I, its state could be an arbitrary vector in 2D. So classically, uh, this uh, operation of tensor products corresponds to the Cartesian product of of, of underlying spaces. Yeah, sorry, I, 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 my connection was broken for a moment. I think maybe I lack some, uh, I'm not quite sure I'm getting like this classic and classical uh, analogy. Like, uh, yeah, I don't, uh, I don't really come from physics perspective. Uh, uh, so, so maybe I'm missing some, something uh, you're saying there. Uh, I'm not quite sure. Mm. Okay, kind of the, the, the idea is that uh, you have only two, uh, perfectly distinguishable states, kind of the zero and one, right? Just like you, you think that on your computer, your, your bit could be zero or one, but then if it was a quantum computer, then it can be in the superposition, which is kind of zero and one at the same time. Like some people object to this, um, this uh, description of at the same time, because it comes with its fine print. So per perhaps a way to say it is that uh when you are reading the state of a qubit, you can read either zero and to, and to one, but uh, in some quantum reality, it can be in any of those uh, states and uh, in, in, in any, any su uh, superposition. And this really distinguishes it from the classical situation where if you can read it as either zero or one, then it is either zero and, uh, and uh, one or, or, or uh, one. Yeah, so, so maybe so, a good, good thing to say that is we cannot directly like as we cannot directly see these quantum states. The only way to get classical information out of them is by performing some measurement, right? Like uh, with like a two outcome uh, measurement. So, uh, so my, my guess is like, uh, I mean like so, what really makes them quantum is not like that you have a state that you have like how do you say superpositions of states but like rather that you have like the non-commutativity of operators on c2 i mean like that you have for example like uh, the measurements are exactly like describing this right i mean like yes yes i mean non-commutativity is one of the uh, one of the kind of like like usually if we look at some uh in some scenario and we see, oh, kind of all the things you can do are just uh, diagonal, so they would all commute uh, some basis, uh, then, then we would refer to it as classical. Hmm. But I mean, this is kind of a mathematical model, right? For, for something uh, that, that, is, uh, that, that is happening physically. Okay, yeah, I mean, yeah. I try to. So, uh, excuse me, just one remark. So, in other words, uh, the state space of a classical system still is a, a convex set. Yes, this corresponds to, to measure. Pure states corresponds to, to measures which are concentrated at exactly one point. 
Dirac measure, but but the state space uh, for the classical system could be identified with uh, the space of all probabilistic measure measures. Okay, so so this is still this is still convex. Yes, like the the state, like the classical states would would be convex, but we kind of look together at uh, the states and the operations that we can do on them. Like, mm -hmm. yes, yes, yes. Uh, no, no, come on, Adam. Sorry, the difference is what Slavra was saying. The point is not what is your state space. It's a set. Exactly. Right? Exactly. It's some. Yeah. Um, the point is your measurements, right? The algebra of, the of your measurements, the commutative or non-commutative, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, for quantum, in quantum systems, non commutative period, right? Okay. It's matrices instead of functions. Mm -hmm. yes. That's the yes, difference. Yes. I agree. I agree completely. Thank you. All right. Uh, thanks for the tough questions uh, and, and the help in answering that. Uh, okay. So, uh, one more thing, like kind of one caveat I want to point out that, that, that sometimes people jump too quickly to conclusions after seeing this exponential state space and, and uh, suggest that, well, maybe we could uh, try to solve NP-complete problems, such as, say, satisfiability of, uh, of some constraint system by simply kind of tr trying all possible solutions at once, right? And, and seeing if there exists one that satisfies our constraints. And, and things are not that simple. We don't believe that we can so solve NP-complete problems in polynomial time on quantum computers. Um, uh, so sort of when you design quantum algorithms, you actually need to take care so that the, these amplitudes that you want amplify each other and the other ones cancel out, the unwanted ones cancel out. Okay. All right. Now that we've seen a little bit about this superposition, uh, we can also talk about quantum entanglement. And entanglement is a property of composite systems, right? So we need at least two qubits to talk about uh, entanglement. And very intuitively speaking, we would say that, well, it happens if you cannot describe the states um, of individual qubits um, uh, independently. Okay, I'm gonna show you a cartoon example. Okay, so if we look at this state on the right, okay, so this is a uniform superposition uh, between uh, these two states. So this would be kind of um, the first standard basis vector. This would be the second one in C4. Then um, this is not entangled because you see like this first memory cell is always in this uh, state zero. So I could alternatively describe it by saying, oh, the first one is in state zero and the second one is uniform superposition between zero and one. Okay, however, the one on the left um, uh, cannot be factored in such a way. So uh, uh, this is an entangled state, okay? But uh, more precisely mathematically, uh, so if we have a tensor product state space, right? Then we say uh, that a vector corresponding to a quantum state is entangled. Well, if we cannot write it as a tensor product, but if some V1 in our first space tends to V2 in the second space, then it's entangled. I'm kind of, there is um, some, uh, like in, entanglement gives rise to some very interesting phenomena like that we can observe in the real world. Okay, so if, if we think that we have Alice and Bob and they now, uh, I don't know, they have two photons that in, are in some entangled state, right? And one photon is with Alice, the other one is with Bob. Um, then Alice could do some measurement on her photon and kind of the, the, the effect experienced by her part would be immediately felt uh, by Bob's photon, okay? Now, it seems like there might be some kind of problem with, uh, with the faster than light communication, but kind of the trick is that, well, Alice can do this measurement, but she cannot, she cannot impact at will what measurement outcome she will get, okay? So she cannot impact this state on Bob. She knows maybe if she chooses her measurement wisely and the state they choose the this entangled state uh, wisely that they they will always say get the same outcome. Okay, but she cannot choose what this outcome will be, and that prevents them kind of that that prevents them from transmitting information faster than the speed of light. Okay, but what we can do with entanglement is kind of get correlation of behaviors, and we can get stronger correlation than we would be able using kind of classical resources. And then this stronger than classical uh, 
uh, correlation can in, in turn be harnessed to, to achieve certain operational and cryptographic tasks. Okay, so they, these two agents, they can coordinate their behavior kind of in stronger than classical ways. All right, I'm just gonna sketch kind of few major areas of application uh, of quantum entanglement. Well, the first one is for communication. So you might, uh, uh, you might either use existing communication channels more efficiently, or you might, um, uh, entanglement might allow you to trade some kind of cheaper communication resource for a more expensive one, like uh, classical communication uh, plus entanglement gives you quantum communication actually. And this is called uh, quantum teleportation protocol. And the second kind of big area of application is for cryptography. For me personally, one of the uh, most exciting developments lately uh, is this, um, the so-called device independent cryptography. And the idea here is that you can use kind of, you can design protocols uh, where you can guarantee that if you take devices, you, you buy your devices from someone who you do not trust, you can use, still use these devices um, in a manner that guarantees that your uh, information is not compromised. Okay. Somehow you, you, you use some component which you do not trust, which might be perhaps trying to listen in on everything that you say, and in the end, kind of your information remains protected. Okay. It's counterintuitive that this is even possible. Okay, and it turns out that you can even use uh, entanglement to study black hole dynamics. Like people have looked at what happens uh, if you take half of an uh, entangled state, you throw it in a, into a black hole and analyze kind of the consequences of it. And there are some paradoxes that uh, arise from this and we're still trying to resolve this. Okay, so kind of so far, the, the, the takeaway I would like you to have is that, well, entanglement uh, can be used to kind of get these advantages, quantum advantages, so outperform existing conventional technologies. But there is a kind of a flip side uh, to entanglement. And it is uh, that actually it's really hard to analyze uh, these entanglement assisted strategies that they just seem mathematically unwieldy. Okay, so they, they, they correspond to hard mathematical problems. Okay, and, and this in turn has, uh, has its consequences, right? So if we want to use uh, entanglement kind of to to outperform existing technologies, but then we cannot analyze these entanglement assisted protocols because we lack some mathematical understanding, then, then we cannot fully understand what will, we will be able to do with uh, entanglement. Okay, and, and therefore I want to say that we kind of need uh, two things. Well, first we need to develop some general methods, mathematical methods for analyzing uh, quantum entanglement and then use, and then these could be used to kind of identify new applications of entanglement. So I don't believe that we've yet are even close to understanding what, uh, what consequences of entanglement are there for information processing. We have some examples, some really interesting examples, but I think we're nowhere close to uh, having a full understanding. Okay, so but kind of to, to talk about this point one, these, these general methods for analyzing entanglement, uh, we need some kind of abstract model in which to, um, uh, where we can model these entanglement assisted strategies and, and then analyze them. Right? Um, and luckily we actually already have such a model uh, which is provided through these uh, things I'm gonna call non-local games. And they appear, uh, they are known under different names in various fields, but they appear as central concepts in different fields. For instance, in theoretical computer science, uh, these non-local games would be referred to as one round two prover interactive proof systems. And they've led to um, one, of the, one of the central results in, in complexity theory, uh, the so-called PCP theory. Um, now um, in foundations of physics, kind of the origin of non-local games could be traced back to uh, Einstein Podolsky Rosen paradox or some uh, maybe you are um, you know it by the name of spooky action at a distance, right? And then as a response to this, like uh, John P Bell proposed this experimental setup, which was essentially a non-local game that could then be used to test whether or not this spooky action at a distance indeed takes place in the real world or not. Okay. Um, uh, well, nowadays uh, we have had 
very many uh, experimental demonstrations that in, in, indeed uh, this phenomenon is real. Um, uh, yes, I'm just citing um, one of the most uh, recent uh, experiments that closed certain technological loopholes that have been a challenge before. Okay, and finally, these games also appear uh, in cryptography, uh, and in, in particular, they are behind uh, these device-independent protocols uh, that I mentioned before. Okay, now I want to tell you what is a non-local game uh, using um, using um, uh, using an example. Okay, uh, it's perhaps my favorite game is called a Magic Square game. Okay, so we have two parties, Alice and Bob, and we think that they are on a, on a I, I, drew, I drew this wall here to denote that they kind of cannot talk to each other after the start of the game. So, and then we have this three by three square, and we would like to fill it in with zeros and ones so that every row sum is even and every column sum is odd. Okay, we're gonna ask uh, Alice to fill in one of the columns. She doesn't know which one. We're gonna ask Bob for a row. And then in order uh, for them to win, we will ask that they satisfy uh, two conditions. The first one is that this parity is right. So it needs to be uh, odd for Alice for the columns and even for Bob for the rows. And we also ask that they are kind of consistent on the intersection. So, right, if I take a row, uh, column and a row, they intersect in one square. And we ask that Alice and Bob assign the same number, so zero or one, to that entry in the intersection. Now, let's see an example. We could ask Alice for second column and Bob for the first row. Can someone tell me if they would win or lose? Consistent. Yes, so they would lose because they are not being consistent, right? Um, okay, but uh, so but the parity is fine, right? So uh, so it is odd for Alice and even for Bob, uh, right? They are inconsistent on this this square. So Bob says zero, but Alice says one. All right, um, now. Uh, they could change their answers in, in, in this manner, right? Uh, the parity is now preserved uh, and also they're being consistent. So uh, now uh, they win, uh, okay? Excuse me, so uh, they both win or they both lose, yes? Yeah, good. They're uh, not playing uh, against each other, yes? Yes, yes. I understand very, it correctly? Very, very, okay. Yes, exactly. Okay. Uh, thank you for the comment. Uh, exactly, so this is a... Uh, uh, this is not like uh, some, um, this is a cooperative game, right? So Alice and Bob are going to win or lose together. Right? Okay, okay, thank you. They're kind of playing against the person who's asking them the question. And this no communication, it is only, uh, so uh, they can talk beforehand to agree on some sort of strategy that they will use. So they know this game, right? They know how we're going to score them. Uh, but they don't know which precise column and which precise row we're going to ask them. So that's the information they do not know. And that's the information that this wall prevents them from learning uh, from each other. But excuse me, I, I do not understand one, one mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. uh, this, uh, if we sum up all the possible uh, entries, uh, we get what number, even or odd? Uh, since we would uh, like yeah, to that, that, that's a very good question. <laughs> all right. So, uh, thank you. I promise the question is not planted. I'm, I'm about to answer it on this slide. Uh, so, um, so what you can show essentially that any strategy that Alice, like if, if you wanted a strategy for Alice and Bob uh, that would allow them to win irrespective of which row and column we asked them, then this would essentially amount to a filling of this three by three grid uh, with zeros and ones uh, so that the row sums are even and the column sums are odd, okay? And then Alice and Bob could simply respond according to this filling, right? And they would always be consistent and the, the, these parity conditions would be satisfied. But now as some of you uh, already uh, observed uh, keenly is that it's not possible to do this, right? And the way you see it is that assume that it exists, right? And then you get, can get the total sum uh, by say adding the row sums and that would tell that the total sum is even, right? Um, 
or adding up the column sums. And that would tell you that the total sum is odd. And of course, this is impossible. So such a filling does not exist, right? Okay. Does, does this address, uh, Adam, your, uh, your concern? <laughs> Okay, so so this is it is impossible to win. It is impossible to win with probability one, right? Like okay. there could still be a strategy that wins with actually pretty good probability if you ask them these questions uniformly at random, right? Um, okay, so it's impossible to win this game perfectly classically. Okay, but it turns out that if you if you allow quantum entanglement, actually just um, uh, just uh, C4 cross C4 uh, of shared state uh, is enough uh, to achieve this. Um, then uh, there exists a strategy for Alice and Bob that allows them to always win, irrespective of which row and column you ask them. So they will always give you consistent answers, and these parities uh, are going to be correct as well. Right? Okay. So that was uh, kind of an example of a non local game. Um, now let me introduce the, uh, the, the general model. So here we kind of, in the most simple form, the non-local game has, um, has these uh, parties. So Alice and Bob, they are playing together, they're collaborating, and then you have a, a verifier or referee. Uh, and you should think of this, this guy as, as the person who was asking these rows and columns to Alice and Bob, and then checking whether uh, they uh, uh, satisfy these consistency and parity requirements for winning. And then the game goes as follows. So uh, verifier selects two questions, S and T. He sends one to Alice, the other one to Bob. These would be these rows and uh, row index or column index for Bob. Um, and he does so according to some uh, probability distribution pi. And then Alice and Bob answer with, uh, with their uh, respective answers. Okay, and then uh, after receiving these answers, uh, the verifier evaluates and announces whether uh, Alice and Bob lose or win uh, based on the questions and answers provided. Um, and now uh, this probability distribution pi and this verification function B is known uh, to Alice and Bob before the start of the game. So they could uh, try to agree on some strategy that allows them to maximize their chances of winning. However, remember there was this wall between Alice and Bob, so they cannot talk to each other after they've gotten these, uh, these questions, which essentially means that Bob doesn't know what S Alice was asked, and Alice doesn't know what T Bob was asked. All right, and then what the players want to do is they want to maximize their expected chances of winning. Okay, So the expectation would be over this pi or uh, any kind of uh, uh, local or shared randomness that Alice and Bob might have. And then we kind of have these two figures of merit. What is the highest success probability for a given game that classical Alice and Bob can get, right? So for this uh, magic square game, we said that this is less than one. Uh, and uh, what is the highest uh, expected in, uh, success probability that quantum players can get? Okay, so for this magic square, it would be success probability one, because we said that there is a strategy that allows Alice and Bob to always win. And, and it's important to know that kind of the game, the description of the game remains the same, both in quantum case and in the classical case. All that changes is kind of the set of the available strategies for Alice and Bob. All right, so we have these two quantities of merit, this uh, omega and omega star, one classical, the other one uh, quantum. And um, the, the reason why we can use no, uh, non-local games to study entanglement would be that we take our operational or cryptographic task and then we model it as a, this non-local game. And then uh, to see whether or not uh, entanglement assistance is beneficial in this setting uh, would correspond to asking, is this omega star greater than omega, right? And to answer how helpful, how much improvement are we getting, that would then correspond to difference or, or ratio of these two quantities. Okay, so now uh, in the classical case, you can show that this uh, best classical success probability is uh, NP hard to compute. So you might be only able to tackle small problem sizes. But now in the quantum case, it turns out that this omega star cannot be computed 
at all. So this means that there is no algorithm that given the description of this game outputs this omega star. There's no such algorithm it does not exist. Okay. So it's, it is an undecidable problem. Um, and actually, not only this omega star cannot be computed, it turns out that it cannot even be approximated. And this was a huge breakthrough um, um, uh, for establishing uh, this result. And it also implies implied uh, a negative resolution for Connus embedding problem. Uh, all right. So, okay, but there are some practical consequences to kind of this uh, uncomputability question, namely that there are some actually very small games. Um, so the smallest that we know, I, I think that we've wondered about is uh, where each party has just three questions and uh, two answers each, right? And we don't know what the quantum value is. So if you want to compute the classical value for, for such a small game, you can just sit down for, I don't know, 15 minutes, half an hour, and you'll figure it out. And uh, quantum value, we still don't know, even though a lot of people have tried. Um, okay, so uh, how does this happen? How can it be that such a small kind of three question, two answer thing that we cannot figure it out, right? Uh, so whenever, whenever you have some undecidability results, there needs to be something, right? That goes to infinity. Otherwise you could just exhaustively check all the possibilities and see which one is the best. And kind of the thing that goes to infinity here is this, uh, the dimension of uh, this uh, shared entangled state, right? So you don't know how big shared state in how high a dimension Alice and Bob might need to share in order to reach optimal performance. Okay. So you can enumerate the classical strategies, but not the quantum ones. Yes. Excuse me, may I ask a question? Yes. So how do we understand the statement that this uh, omega star cannot be even approximated? So there is no algorithm uh, for? Yes. So um, so the part, so there, in general, one can talk about different approximations, right? Like up to multiplicative or additive accuracy. In this case, it's the stronger one, the additive one. So if you ask to decide between two options, so I give you a game, right? Described by pi and this verification function v. And I ask you to decide between two options. I promise you that it's one of the two. Either the, uh, the game has value one or it has quantum value. So this omega star is equal to one or it is less than a half. Okay. I ask okay. you this question. Okay. And okay. this question is undecidable. Uh -huh. So there is a gap uh, of length one half, yes? Yes, uh, I mean, this one half is not, you can push it uh, further down if you, uh, ah, okay. Okay, uh, if you okay. want, uh, some, some constant, there is a constant gap. That is the kind of uh, um, uh, the significant state. Okay, okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, all right, so what have we seen so far? So. I, I talked kind of about uh, quantum computing in general, right? How um, basically the, the goal of quantum computing is to, to, to devise practical protocols for practical problems like cryptography, algorithms, so on, right? That outperform these, uh, uh, the existing techno technologies. And then we said, well, one of these basic phenomena uh, responsible for these quantum advantages seem to be entanglement. And then non-local games, uh, supplied us with this mathematical framework that allowed us to study entanglement and ask questions like how big can this gap be between omega, omega star, and so on. Right? Uh, now, as it is with entanglement, uh, uh, it turns out that these questions are mathematically hard. So if you just look at the general non-local game without some additional restrictions, you can write down how these uh, entanglement assisted strategies would look like, but they seem to lack some additional structure that would allow you to kind of say meaningful things. So if you ask some question to kind of answer this question. So they, they are somewhat like um, mathematically unwieldy, one could say. All right, so what do we do? Okay, like one kind of uh, way around this would be instead to look not consider the most general non-local games, but instead look at the specific, particularly well-behaved 
uh, class of games, okay? That do have some additional mathematical structure that then we can leverage to answer the questions that we care about. Okay? And of course, this class of games still needs to be rich enough so that it exhibits interesting uh, properties uh, or features of entanglement. So for example, like this uncomputability of omega star that I mentioned in the previous slide, it was actually answered in the context of uh, what's known as linear system games that possess a group's underlying group structure. Okay, so this was kind of a, a crucial point in answering this question was, was to look at some nicely behaved class of games. So <clears throat> what I want to tell you now about is uh, this um, notion or class of games of for graph isomorphisms, okay? And one reason why I especially like this class of games is because uh, it seems to admit very natural interpretations in, in different fields. So the original definition is gonna come from quantum information. And then we're gonna see that it, they also can be uh, phrased naturally in the language of quantum groups and also in terms of uh, combinatorics and counting complexity specifically. Okay, so that's my plan kind of for the second part. Uh, well, yeah, and the second part also has two parts. So in the first one, I'm gonna introduce this notion of quantum isomorphism. We're gonna see different ways how to think about it. And then if I have time, I will show you uh, elements of the proof for this uh, combinatorial characterization of quantum isomorphism. Okay, so I have about 45 minutes, right? Um, okay, I'll take that. Yeah, as even, it. even less, 41, exactly. 41, okay. Um, all right, good. So let's just together recall the uh, what it means for graphs to be isom uh, isomorphic, right? Uh, well, it just means that the graph is the same, but maybe we've labeled the vertices differently, so it's not obvious at first. Okay, now more formally, uh, you, in order to show that two graphs are isomorphic, you would need to uh, exhibit uh, an isomorphism map F that takes vertices of one graph to those of the other. And this F would need to be a bijection and would need to preserve the structure of your graph. So I'm using this tilde uh, to denote um, adjacency in the graph, okay? So um, the two Just make it perfectly of, clear. If your graph is unoriented. Yes, it's not all. And, and uh, you allow multiplicities for edges, or is it just a single? No, yes let's say no? it's a simple graph. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, and so okay, and then whenever such f exists, right, such a bijection that preserves the structure of my, our graph, then then we say that two graphs are isomorphic. Now, there is yet another way to uh, formulate uh, graph isomorphism, and that is in terms of matrices. I'm maybe sometimes going to refer to it as matrix formulation of isomorphism. Okay? So here, uh, this is in terms of the adjacency matrices of the two graphs. So I have, um, so in adjacency matrix, right, you just write a one whenever two uh, vertices are adjacent, and then zero otherwise. So this is the adjacency matrix for G. This is the one for H. And then you say the two graphs are isomorphic precisely when you can find this correspondence, this permutation matrix that conjugates the adjacency matrix of one graph to that of the other. Okay, so we have these two ways of thinking about graph isomorphism, but now to introduce quantum isomorphism, I will want to think of graph isomorphism in terms of a non-local game. And what you should think here uh, is that what Alice and Bob are trying to do is they are trying to convince the referee or verifier that the two graphs are uh, graphs G and H are indeed the same. So they are isomorphic. That's kind of the intuition to keep in mind, right? And to make the game slightly simpler for uh, the purposes of the exposition, let's now assume that the two graphs G and H, they have the same number of vertices, okay? We'll only consider isomorphism games on, for where the two graphs have the same number of vertices. You can do it more generally, but then the game becomes more complicated. Okay, so the game. So the referee selects two vertices, G and G prime from uh, graph G, sends one to Alice, the other one to Bob. And then Alice and Bob need to respond with vertices from H. Uh, and uh, for winning, we require um, that the relationship uh, between the 
uh, question vertices G and G prime is the same as the relationship uh, between uh, the answer vertices H and H prime. And what do I mean by relationship? Well, if I take two vertices from the same graph, G and G prime, uh, then they could be related in one out of three different ways. So they could be the same vertex, G is equal to G prime, they could be adjacent, or they could be distinct non-adjacent. Okay, so this relationship takes two, three, sorry, three different values. Same, uh, distinct non-adjacent are adjacent. And we're checking that this relationship is the same. Okay, and as before, uh, question. yes. So um, for understanding, so they, they both get a graph or? They yeah, so, so the, the two graphs, G and H, they define the game. So they know that they are playing some uh -huh. fixed graph, comma, fixed graph uh, isomorphism game. That's what Alice and Bob know. And they just receive, so um, they receive edges. No, G was an edge, right? Uh, so uh, L yeah, G, sorry, those, are, those are vertices, right? G and G vertices. prime are two vertices, but they could be the same vertex. So it could be that G and G prime is the same. So the referee selects randomly, say uniformly at random. So, uh, but they're both uh, vertices from G? Yeah, they're both vertices from G. In the case when uh, when the two graphs have the same number of vertices, I can play the simpler version of the game where uh, both of them receive vertices of G and respond with vertices of A. And they know beforehand that G and H are isomorphic? No, that, that's, the, that's the question. I, I could play this game on non-isomorphic graphs. I, this game is defined on any pair of graphs. So, and they win, when do, when do they win? They win if they, uh, so we could, um, a particular round, right? They win if, so if they manage to respond with H and H prime that have the same relationship as G and G prime. So if referee, for instance, sent two adjacent vertices, so G and G prime were adjacent in graph G, then Alice and Bob would win if they manage to respond with two adjacent vertices from graph H. But, but if, uh, if G and H, like capital G and capital H from the beginning are not isomorphic? Yes, yes, then, oh, okay, uh, all right. So classic, like, again, if we talk cla with, about classical strategy, it's not hard to see that the classical players will be able to win this game with certainty. And what I mean with that is that they will win irrespective of, there's a strategy that allows them to win irrespective of which G and G prime uh, the referee selected. If and only if the graphs actually are the same, right? So, mm -hmm. so one direction is maybe very easy to see, right? If the graphs are the same, they could agree on this isomorphism map F, right? And then simply correspond according to this F. So if Alice gets G, she responds with F of G. Bob responds, mm -hmm. uh, responds with F of G prime. Now, because it is an isomorphism, right? Uh, this relationship is going to be preserved. And there's no classical winning strategy if they're not isomorphic. Yeah, essentially you can take, uh, I mean, you have to be a little bit more careful, right? You have to describe what precisely is the set of all allowed classical strategies, but essentially you can extract an isomorphism uh, from, uh, from a classical, from a uh, strategy that wins with certainty and is classical. You can extract uh -huh. this isomorphism map F. So the probabilistic uh, part is like part of the game also, like. If you can win with with probability one, yes, yes, okay. I think I see. Yes, yeah. They need to win. You you could say with probability one or irrespective of which GG prime we ask them. Right, that's the same. Oh, okay. Thanks. But I'm still a bit confused about who sees which graph. So uh, Alice and Bob. They Every, both... Everyone, everyone sees all the graphs. Okay. So the graphs G and H are part of the definition of the game. Okay. So they know what what game they agree to play. Okay. okay. So they both know the both graphs, yes, Alice and Bob, but they do not know which answer they are giving during the game, yes? Yeah, so they what they don't know, so Alice knows little g, the vertex of graph g, right? But she doesn't know g prime, okay. right? She doesn't know this bit of information. And similarly, Bob doesn't okay. know this. Okay, and I I've, I've have one more question. Maybe it is a stupid question, but you, you're right that Alice and Bob want to convince a referee. So what happens if the referee is 
keep asking just the same question. Sorry, he is giving just the same vertex on and on, and he will never be convinced that these two graphs are isomorphic. But so, he want... it randomly. Aha, uh -huh. okay, so, so this G is given randomly, yes? The, the little G and G prime, yes. Uh -huh. okay. I mean, this is, this is just for an intuition. Like, uh, this okay. is not a formal thing. Um, the formal definition of a game is, is somehow this, right? Uh, is this verification function. Here, I'm essentially describing the verification function, which are the winning uh, and losing uh, input out, like uh, question answer pairs. Okay, so I, so we, we discussed, right, that if the graphs are isomorphic, it's easy to win this game. And when I say win, I will always just to, for, for, uh, uh, to, to be concise, I will actually mean with certainty, right? This, mm -hmm. there, there exists a strategy that wins with certainty, irrespective of which G and G prime is, are being asked. Um, so then we define quantum isomorphism and we denote it with this congruence of QC symbol, if there exists a quantum strategy uh, that allows the players to win with certainty. Okay? So just like remember in, in this magic square, I said that there's a quantum strategy that allows Alice and Bob to always uh, answer so that this parity and consistency conditions are satisfied. All right, um, now with this definition, we are, uh, we are working in what's called commuting uh, model of, of quantum uh, mechanics or quantum information, uh, rather than the more usual tensor product model that is adopted in the, in the context of quantum information and computing. Okay, so I'll explain uh, what this commuting model means. That means what it will have an uh, impact on what strategies we are allowed for Alice and Bob. Excuse me, so this is a weaker notion, yes? This is a strong, well, well, more, okay. Uh, the, 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 this notion of isomorphism that it gives uh, is weaker. So more things, uh, more things are um, become isomorphic, okay? So, but, so we, we cannot, maybe we cannot win classically, but still we can win uh, oh, uh, okay. quantum setting. And then these graphs are not isomorphic in the classical sense, but they are uh, quantum isomorphic. Yes, yes, yeah. Okay. Uh, I, I mis misunderstood. I, th I thought actually the question was about commuting versus tensor product model, but the, the answer remains unchanged. It's the same uh, in both okay. cases. Okay. Um, okay. All right. So now let's let's take a look. How do these strategies look like? Okay, mathematically, what does it mean uh, uh, that there exists this uh, quantum strategy? So now this is kind of what would describe uh, a quantum strategy. This is, would both fit um, the tensor product model or the uh, commuting model, okay? So there's some shared state between Alice and Bob. And then uh, upon receiving her uh, vertex G, Alice needs to kind of extract, get some classical information out. She needs to decide which H she's gonna respond. So uh, without loss of generality, we can assume that she performs uh, a quantum measurement and the measurement outcome. So when you perform measurement, what you get is like a classical label. Like a, you can think of it as some reading on some, some device. Right? Um, and we index these uh, measurement outcomes with vertices of H because those are uh, the outcomes, um, uh, the answers that Alice needs to provide. Okay? And similarly, for every uh, vertex of G, also Bob has some measurement. I'm calling it this uh, script F. And now the model that we have comes into play in how, what is the math, mathematical object that describes this psi and, and these, these measurements. And so if I'm in this commuting model, then psi is simply a unit vector in some Hilbert space H. If it was a tensor product, then I would require that this H is a tensor product of two spaces, one kind of belonging to Alice, the other one to Bob. And um, a quantum measurement would be uh, described um, by uh, positive operators that add up to identity if I sum over the possible outcomes, okay? So essentially what Alice has 
uh, if, if she has decided on what measurement she will perform, she has these operators EGH um, that live uh, in here. And we know that if, they, uh, if we add them up, um, sum over H, then uh, we get identity. Okay, and similarly for Bob, right? Uh, she, he has some FGHs that describe his measurement. And now uh, this locality um, in the tensor product model, then we would require that sort of these EGHs, they would be uh, operators on the Alice's space, some HA, and the FGHs, uh, they are operators on Bob's space, HB. Okay? But in the commuting model, the only requirement is that they commute. So each one of these guys commutes with each one of these guys. But of course, uh, between themselves, EGHs will generally not commute. Excuse me. So in this tensor mod, uh, product uh, model, these operators are uh, can be identified with uh, something uh, uh, on the first leg of a tensor product and, and for Bob uh, on the second leg, yes? Yes, exactly. And then if we want to think of these operators as on, being on the total Hilbert space, we just tensor identity on the other, mm -hmm. uh, on the missing part. Um, okay, so now this is a strategy, right? The psi together with the bunch of these EGHs and FGHs. Now, if Alice and Bob play according to this strategy, then quantum mechanics tells us how we can compute the probability that upon receiving these vertices G and G prime, they respond with H and H prime. And this probability is given by this inner product, okay? So we take the inner product between psi and then psi acted upon with this E times F. All right, now maybe is a good time uh, to, to show you an example, right? Uh, as it was mentioned that, uh, uh, that uh, these uh, quantum strategies are, are, are more powerful uh, than classical ones. So in principle, and this notion of quantum isomorphism is only interesting if we can find a pair of graphs that are two different graphs, but nevertheless, they are quantum isomorphic. Okay? And um, this was actually like when, when we looked at this, this was not an easy task to do, uh, as I said, right? Uh, I mean, we cannot just kind of search over all possible strategies. I, I told you this is an undecidable problem. So there's no algorithm. Um, but we found uh, a general construction that is based on a reduction uh, from this other class of games uh, known as linear system games. So here uh, I have uh, drawn the smallest example that we know. So these are two graphs, G and H. So you, you can all quickly check, right, that they are not isomorphic. Go back and forth a few times. Um, uh, I, I'm, I'm joking, I'm asking you to trust, take my word for it that uh, these are not the same graph, uh, um, but uh, we can prove that they are quantum isomorphic. So, so these have uh, 24 uh, vertices and this is the smallest example that we know of. And we know actually that uh, if your graph has uh, less than 16 vertices, then, uh, then you won't see this difference, the separation between quantum isomorphism and classical. So you won't get a very small example. Okay, uh, any question here? All right. Maybe I have a question for the previous slide. Mm -hmm. So you wrote that uh, Alice and Bob share a quantum state uh, psi. So, so what is psi in this context? It should be given uh, at the beginning of the game before any information was, uh, was sent, yes? Yes, yes, it, it does not depend on this G, it cannot depend on this GG prime and HH prime. You think that, oh, uh, before the game starts, so they know this, these graphs, G and H, Alice and Bob meet somewhere, they prepare their quantum state psi, right? Each one of them, like, uh, so if it was, say, just uh, described by some two photons and some entangled state, Alice takes her photon, Bob takes his photon, they go to their separate uh, places, right? And afterwards, then, the referee comes and asks them these uh, vertices G and G prime. So this uh, psi uh, can be somehow described or? Uh, uh, yes, like- this Psi is born from this uh, part of the two graphs since it has to be somehow universally determined, yes? 
Uh, no, so psi can depend on the graphs, G and H, but it cannot yeah. depend on, on these vertices, a little, this, this G and G prime, right? Mm -hmm. oh. But uh, actually, I, I mean, for, uh, for, um, uh, for this class, uh, like in general, for general non-local games, this psi might differ. But for uh, isomorphism games, because they have this nice mathematical structure, like, okay, uh, I'm, uh, in the tensor product model, for, for instance, we, we know that some specific types of states are always uh, sufficient. They're called maximally entangled states. We still don't know in which dimension we need to take this maximally entangled state, but um, we know that it's the maximally entangled state that is the optimal uh, state to choose here. We just, we don't know, but we don't know the size of the Hilbert space general, in general. Sorry, can you can know the size of the Hilbert space. So this Hilbert space isn't somehow constructed from uh, uh, just vertices and... Uh, and uh, no, so that's the interesting uh, thing that this Hilbert space, you cannot bound the, the, the dimension of this Hilbert space necessary in terms of the number of vertices in GNH. Ooh. Okay. 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 Can you explain uh, this point that you just mentioned, like that uh, maximal entangled states are always sufficient uh, to find the best possible strategy? Mm. Well, it's a. Uh, uh, I don't know how to. Uh, I mean, I cannot. Uh, I cannot prove it to you, like right, right here. Like, uh, okay, can you somehow? What, what type, kind of answer you are looking for? Mm, it's a theorem, I, I could say. Yes, because I'm, I'm seeing like the, these. Uh, I'm seeing this this come up like quite often, like in in articles, like um, mm -hmm. in this in this area. Yes. And, uh, and it, okay, so we can assume like, uh, or we can let's take like a maximally entangled state. Another yes, it, it's because you, you, what you do is you start from a strategy, uh, you assume that it uh, gives you uh, the success probability one, and then you can essentially show that on what's called support of, like, if you, okay, if you, if you kind of uh, require that your, your state is somehow full rank, like locally full rank, uh, then you can show that if you succeed, um, with, uh, with perfect success probability, then it means that um, th this strategy kind of breaks down into some irre irreducible components. And within each component, uh, all kind of, we, we call them Schmidt coefficients are the same. I mean, it's a proof. It's a proof you, you assume that you have a strategy that succeeds with, with probability one, and then you analyze what kind of properties this uh, strategy necessarily has. Mm -hmm. But there's no, there's just like more like of a, a um, like a principle, not really like a, like that, like look for a maximal entangled states. That's what you're saying, like. Uh, so a, a principle. Uh, I'm I'm saying that it's a it's a statement that one can prove. So what is the statement? It's the statement that, uh, um, okay, the weaker type of statement would be that if there exists. Uh, a perfect strategy, so one that succeeds with certainty for in this uh, isomorphism game, in the tensor product model, then there is also a strategy uh, which uses, which, which takes this psi uh, to be maximal entangled. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Because in, for a general non-local game, it's not true. It could be that you can actually get higher success probabilities with states that are not maximal entangled. In the tensor model? Yes, yes. So not for graph isomorphism games, but for... For other games, yes. I see, I see. So it's particular for graph isomorphism games that you can uh, always... Yes, there is a larger class of games. So maybe you've heard about synchronous games or even uh -huh. further generalizations of that. And we know that for those games, maximally entangled states are enough. I see, okay. Yeah, great, thanks. Uh, all right. 
All right, so what I want to show you now is how we can think uh, about quantum isomorphisms in quantum group theoretic terms. Okay. So, and to do that, I want to introduce, I need to introduce this notion of a quantum permutation matrix. Okay, so remember a regular permutation matrix, right, is a zero one matrix such that along every uh, row and column, you have precisely one one, or alternatively, you could express this as if you look at the row sum and column sum, then that is equal to one. Right now, a quantum permutation matrix is defined similarly, but now instead of entries being just zero or one, you allow them to be projections. Okay, so uh, it, from some C star algebra. Okay, so if, if this was a C star algebra of, of matrices, right, then projections would kind of have uh, eigenvalues zero or one. So it's, in that way, you can see it as a, as a generalization of being zero or one. Or alternatively, you could say that they satisfy these. Uh, 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 equalities. And then you also require uh, that if you uh, sum up these elements p, i, j, right, that are uh, elements from the C star algebra along any row or column, then you get uh, one, which in this case is uh, the algebra identity. All right, and then now uh, if your C star algebra was just a complex numbers, then you would recover the notion of a permutation matrix. And so what we showed is that uh, two graphs are, are quantum isomorphic. If and only if you can find this quantum permutation matrix P that conjugates the adjacency matrix of your graph G to that of H. Okay? So see at the syntactic level, this looks exactly like the matrix based definition for uh, isomorphism where we require the existence of a permutation matrix that conjugates the adjacency matrix one graph to that of the other. Okay. So so this now it, Agency matrices are uh, uh, classical, yes? Yeah, they are just zero one matrices. So uh, can, uh, can you can make sense of this, uh, this product, right? Uh, because you can multiply uh, your algebra uh, elements with, uh, with scalars. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, Give me just one more question. In this mm -hmm. case, uh, could we describe the underlying sister algebra in terms of G and H? This um, relation is for P having entries in some sister algebra, yes? Yes. With some, some sister algebra. So uh, is it possible to describe this sister algebra in terms of G and H? This is, I don't know, so related to graph sister algebra or? Um, so you cannot, for instance, bound the dimension of the C star algebra uh, in, in, in terms of the graphs. I mean, you have these, these uh, uh, you, you know that in this C star algebra, you have these projections, right? That add up to this, mm -hmm. you, you okay. know that about your C star algebra and uh, the number of them um, uh, depends uh, on the number of vertices uh, in your two graphs. Right? Uh, so these IJ, um, they are uh, take, if your graphs have N vertices, then uh, the, this i takes value from one to n. Uh, but uh, other than that, like you, you cannot bound, the, as I said, this dimension. Uh, okay, okay, but uh, uh, I don't know. If I, I'm pretty comfortable with the situation where uh, the sister algebra is infinite dimensional. So, so still mm -hmm. the matrices are finite matrices, but the entries lie in some infinite, possibly infinite dimensional. Yes, yes, sister yes. Algebra. yes, yes. All right, um, so now, so I, I should finish 6.45 or how does it go? Sorry. Uh, yes, the answer is yes. I have to admit myself, yes. Okay, uh, great. Um, so next thing I want to show you is, so I said that I see these quantum isomorphisms as lying in the middle, uh, like in the intersection between these circles, right? So this definition in terms of non-local gain that kind of comes from the area of quantum computing and information, right? And now I showed you some quantum groups. Excuse me, uh, may I interrupt you? Yeah. Uh, uh, can you go back to the previous slide? Yes. Uh, uh, your definition of a quantum permutation matrix uh, doesn't 
seem at, at least to me to to go to the classical one uh, uh, because uh, what, what are these PIJ? Uh, shouldn't if they are classically the analog of uh, of um, transportations, so permutations of two indices, they, their square should be the identity. I, I don't understand. Uh, uh, no, they're they're not analogs of transpositions. And so, what is their classical uh, analog? Uh, well, I, I, I don't. It depends what you want to call the. Uh, PIJ replaces uh, the coefficients of the matrices, not, not the whole matrix itself. The whole matrix still is finite matrices, but the coefficient of the matrices are no longer zero and one, but some arbitrary projection. So this corresponds, the classical permutation matrices corresponds to the case uh, with, where this matrix is over C, and the only projection on C are uh, zero and one. So this is how I, I understand this notion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes, so yes, I see it as a, as a generalization of the case where uh, where the entries are zero or, or one. I don't know if this is what you would okay, call okay, the okay, classical. Thanks. Yes, thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Um, okay. So kind of what I want to do now, I want to claim that we've kind of seen this quantum information circle and we've seen this quantum group circle, right? We've seen some quantum groups friendly way to think about uh, quantum isomorphism. Okay, now I want to show you how we can also think uh, about it in terms of uh, just usual combinatorics and counting. And to do this, we need to look at graph homomorphisms. Okay, so, uh, this is what we're going to be counting homomorphisms. So uh, a map from vertices of graph F to G is a graph homomorphism if it preserves adjacency. Okay, so in isomorphism, we needed to preserve both adjacency and non-adjacency. Here, we just need to preserve adjacency. Here's a simple example. I can take a seven cycle and I can map it with a graph homomorphism to a five cycle by identifying these two blue vertices and these two red vertices. Okay, if you want to think in terms of pictures, kind of uh, start with your source graph and you're kind of folding on these edges onto your target graph. All right, but, and you might not only want to ask, is there a homomorphism from one graph to another? But you might want to count how many are there, okay? And this is usually denoted by this hom of f comma g. This is the number of homomorphisms from f to g. And there's a really nice classic result by, by Lovas that says that these homomorphism counts actually determine the graph, okay? What does this mean? So if we check that for all graphs f, these homomorphism counts from f to g and f to h are the same, then this happens if and only if the, actually the two graphs are the same. Okay. So this homomorphism information determines the graph. But it's important that this f, which is your free variable, uh, is always in the domain of a homomorphism. Uh, yes, it's the sort, it, right. It's homomorphism from f to g. Yes. So I cannot just swap it and have the same statement now saying, all right, if I have home GF equal to home HF for all F, then this is it and I'll leave the graphs G and H as a morphing. That's not true. No, that's not true. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, okay. And like, we were really surprised to find out uh, that you can actually characterize quantum uh, isomorphism also in terms of homomorphism counting. All you need to do is that instead of looking at all graphs, you need to look at only planar graphs. So remember how we defined this uh, quantum isomorphism in terms of existence of uh, this quantum strategy, right? And now it ha you can also think in about this kind of operationally uh, defined concept in terms of counting uh, these homomorphs, okay? So on, on this right-hand side, there's kind of nothing quantum. There's no quantum thing hiding somewhere. This is a purely classical thing on the right. And can you remind me of the difference between planar graphs and non-planar graphs? Okay, so it just means that you can draw it in some way that the edges don't cross. Ah, okay. On a plane. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, and it turns out, turns out that this, this, this type of uh, result kind of fits in within a larger context where people have looked at 
what, what kind of relation on, on pairs of graphs do you get if you require that your two graphs uh, have the same homomorphism account from some class of graphs, okay? So for, for Lovas, it was all graphs here. For us, it was planar graphs, but you could just uh, take your favorite class of graphs and ask, what is the relation on graphs, all right? So for instance, uh, if you were counting homomorphisms from cycles, uh, then you would get cospectrality, right? So uh, this is equivalent, these homomorphs accounts being equal is equivalent to the two adjacency matrices being cospectral. And so what uh, does it mean cospectral? Uh, th they have the same eigenvalues, including multiplicities. Uh, but G and H are graphs, so what do you mean by eigen eigenvalues? Uh, the, of the adjacency matrix. Adjacency matrix, okay. okay. Yeah. Um, then there is this other notion of fractional isomorphism. Okay, it's kind of a, you can think of it as a linear relaxation of uh, of graph isomorphism. So uh, instead of uh, requiring that you have a permutation matrix that conjugates the adjacency matrix of one graph to another, you ask that there's a doubly stochastic matrix, right? So this is something that lies uh, in the convex hull of permutation matrices. Um, uh, that uh, that kind of commutes through one one graph to uh, to give you the other one. So you need that S times the adjacency matrix of G is equal to uh, the adjacency matrix of H times S. Okay. All right, this S is doubly stochastic, and it turns out that you get this uh, this relation by uh, counting uh, homomorphisms from trees. And then uh, people have also looked at what happens if instead of trees, we look at graphs uh, with a fixed um, bounded tree width. Okay, so th this parameter often uh, appears uh, when uh, you're interested in running some algorithms efficiently, often things become efficient if you restrict uh, your attention uh, to uh, graphs of bounded tree width, right? And, and then uh, this results in this uh, so-called um, uh, K equivalence notion uh, which is some sort of uh, generalization of this uh, fractional isomorphism. Uh, and there's interesting things you, one can say also about complexity of testing these relations. Okay, so of course, because we have this equival these equivalences here, the complexity of testing the right hand side has to be the same as the complexity of testing the left hand side. So, just very quickly, so tree width, uh, can I think of it as the length of the longest path in the tree? Uh, no, uh, so uh, what's so, the tree width? Uh, so you, uh, it doesn't. It has a pretty involved uh, definition. Essentially, you want to uh, you you want to build this other object where you place uh, vertices from your graph. Uh, this other object now is a tree, and you have certain requirements uh, on. Uh, uh, on, on, on the subsets uh, of vertices corresponding to the new vertices in your tree. Uh, uh, okay. Sorry, I, so I, I can't just explain guess it's it. Okay. Okay. It's, yeah. uh, so kind of, so, um, all right, so trees correspond to here having K either zero or one, uh, I forget. Maybe that helps a little bit. So if I allow larger k, then I'm including things that are not trees. Okay, so so the, here the, the, these are like um, thick trees, right? Uh, so it's not really a tree, but hence my confusion. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. So on Wikipedia it says that the tree with it uh, measures how much the graph is uh, far from the tree. From, like. Uh, from yeah. The tree. Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay, so, so I simply was naively thinking that tree width is the width of a tree, but this is not yeah, no, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's a bigger class of graphs than uh, than trees, yeah. like okay. for for k uh, greater than uh, zero, I guess. And can um, you can you tell me because I somehow missed it, uh, uh, what is the meaning of this f uh, isomorphism here? Um, oh, this fractional isomorphism? Or oh, yeah, yeah, fractional isomorphism. So it's a linear relaxation of isomorphism. Uh -huh. like one, one way to define it is to ask for a doubly stochastic matrix S, uh -huh. such that S times the adjacency matrix of G is equal to the adjacency matrix of H times S. Okay, thank you. You said it, but I somehow missed it. Okay, thanks. Okay, so um, 
And actually, uh, in, in this work, uh, Delgro and Ratan did ask this precise question of what happens if uh, for this uh, class of uh, graphs, you take planar graphs, right? Of course, I, I don't think they expected that the answer is gonna be uh, quantum isomorphism. I don't think they knew at that point what quantum isomorphism was. Um, and another question that they asked is what is the complexity of testing whether uh, for, for, for two graphs G and H, uh, is it the case that uh, the, the number of homomorphisms is the same um, uh, from all planar graphs, okay? So kind of for all things on this slide, uh, the complexity of testing these relations is at most uh, quasi-polynomial, okay? So uh, kind of what well, well, we know, right? Uh, graph isomorphism now, the best thing that we can know how to do uh, due to Babai is it runs in uh, quasi-polynomial time. And then these fractional and k-dimensional equivalents you can test uh, in time that is polynomial for k-dimensional uh, uh, equivalents. It, uh, it, uh, this polynomial, the, the degree of it depends on k. Okay. And this we can also test in polynomial time. Uh, however, this quantum uh, isomorphism, we actually, uh, um, we can show that it is undecidable uh, just like general non-local games, right? So you, if you give me two graphs G and H, it is undecidable to determine whether they are quantum isomorphic. Okay? So what that implies is also that this right-hand side is undecidable, which is surprising because planar graphs seem to be such a nice class of uh, uh, graphs, at least naively uh, speaking. I, for instance, I don't think that uh, Delgro and Ratan ever expected that the complexity could shoot up all the way to uh, undecidable if, if for this class of graphs you take plain. Okay, so um, there's kind of uh, another application of this counting uh, result, which you could think of uh, certifying non-isomorphism. Okay, so if two graphs are quantum isomorphic, then you could try to prove it by exhibiting the strategy that allows you to win the game. Right? So uh, I don't know, if I talk to computer scientists, they're usually not happy with me by, that I'm saying um, certi uh, that it's a certificate because they say, oh, it could be infinite dimensional, but maybe uh, you guys are, are less upset if I call it a certificate, right? So this is not an efficient certificate, but I could, uh, could, could require uh, um, infinite, uh, infinite memory to write that. But uh, the, the question would be, how would I certify that they are not uh, isomorphic, okay? And now that we have this counting characterization, the answer would be, well, you just find uh, a planar graph uh, that has different uh, homomorphism counts uh, to your two graphs, okay? So for instance, if I look at this rook graph, um, so this is where a rook can go, and this is called Shurkanda graph, um, at some point, we wanted to show that they are uh, not quantum isomorphic, and we had some complicated uh, argument for showing this. But now that we have this uh, counting characterization, we can just observe that, well, uh, this, this root graph, it contains K4, so complete graph in four vertices, right? So for instance, here is K4. And what you could check that the Shirkanda graph does not contain K4, okay? So now if you try to, so K4 is planar, right? You could try to count homomorphisms from K4 to this graph and this graph. So here you will get something that is uh, bigger than one. And here you will get zero because there are, uh, this graph does not contain K4s. Right? And the only homomorphisms because you have a complete graph would then actually correspond to having a subgraph. So this is a very easy proof of non-isomorphism for these two graphs. Oh, excuse me. So the idea is that uh, if you have two graphs which are not quantum isomorphic, uh, it would be uh, easier to use this uh, theorem in terms of uh, homomorphism set. But if you have actually two graphs which are quantum isomorphic, uh, it is more, more convenient to work with a definition, yes? Am I right? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, okay. Exactly. Uh, but I guess the point is somehow that before, I didn't even know how would, what would be a certificate of non-isomorphism, right? Like it's not uh, easier or harder, but I just wouldn't know in general what to do if I wanted to prove that two graphs are not quantum isomorphic, right? 
maybe I could come up with some ad hoc thing, but there would be no kind of general form certificate. Whereas with this theorem, there is, it kind of provides you with this general form certificate for mm -hmm. non-isomorphism. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Um, okay. Right. Okay, so I don't think, looking at time, I don't think it's realistic for me to go uh, through the uh, ingredients of the proof uh, for this uh, theorem. So I think I'm just going to go to a uh, summary. Yeah. You're missing a lot of nice pictures, as you can see. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm just trying to summarize everything that I tried to tell you today. Okay, so we talked about quantum computing and information, right, and how entanglement uh, is uh, an important phenomenon um, that we can use to get some advantage over classical technologies and some cryptographic settings or uh, other operational uh, tasks, All right? And then we said that non-local games kind of uh, gave us this uh, framework within which we can study entanglement rigorously. Uh, but then we also said, well, general non-local games, still analyzing these entanglement assisted strategies is hard. So it, it is beneficial to have kind of these nicely behaved classes of games. And then uh, my goal was to convince you that um, these uh, quantum isomorphisms provide, or quantum isom or uh, isomorphism games provide uh, such a nice class of games because uh, these quantum commuting strategies, uh, we can understand them from the uh, perspectives of quantum groups and then hope to use tools developed within that area to study them. Um, or uh, we can also understand them in terms of uh, counting complexity. Um, and uh, that was my plan for today. Uh, and thank you very much for all the very nice questions um, and attention, thanks. Thank you very much, Laura, for your patience with us and for a very beautiful talk. So yeah, you have all clapping hands. And now the fun begins. Now we can grill you with real questions. Thanks. So who, guys, you can fire at will. Who goes first? Ludwig? Well, yes, I have a question, but I, I wonder if I should ask it because I asked for various nice people and could not get answer yet. So. Well. But there are some in the audience. So. Um, OK, so maybe the beginning about superposition principles. So you spoke about superposition for state vectors in the Hilbert space. So really for vectors which we can normalize in order to describe the state. The state is described up to, up to a phase of up to a one number of the state vector, right? Yes. Yeah. And you decide and you defined superposition as a sum of orthogonal vectors. Zero, you call it zero one, they should be state vectors actually. State is a ray, it's a projector. So my question is, do you have superposition only for orthogonal vectors or you have superposition for arbitrary vectors to sum? And if so, what is the superposition of vector psi with a vector minus psi, which is another normalized state vector? Well, I, I don't know. This, this is kind of more a question uh, about uh, physics, right? Like, I mean, um, like your that the, the, the available states that we have are our unit vectors. And normally like you would take, I don't, you would have to ask physicists that they are willing to call that a superposition. Uh, of course, like you can, you cannot, uh, you cannot add psi and minus psi, right? With, you get uh, zero, you which is not zero. a normalized vector, of yes. course, because yes. lack of a state. So there is some problem with the superposition. Well, I mean, <laughs> What if you say you take it for orthogonal states? Where, where's your problem then? No, if we take for orthogonal, it's no problem. But in principle, you should take superposition of also not orthogonal states. But why? I mean, I think uh, the way, OK, so I mean, I'm more work with mathematical formalism, right? Like, I don't know, like I take this mathematical formalism and I see where, where, can, where can we go, right? Uh, but my understanding is the way it corresponds to actual real world is that like these uh, these orthogonal states, you would identify them with um, 
kind of perfectly distinguishable things like uh, polarization uh, one way or another or spin up or down, right? I mean, this mathematical formula, it describes some physical system, right? It, it describes something. It's not that you can say, oh, I can take superposition of anything that, that, that I want. We are kind of not in the realm of math where we can define whatever we want. Well, in the realm of math, it's just a basis. I mean, just two, two basis vectors and then the other is expressed. It is coefficients alpha and beta coefficients with mm -hmm. sum of their uh, absolute values squares to equal one. So, okay, except you were very careful and <laughs> set orthogonal vectors, which is okay. But I think you can also ask superposition of not necessarily orthogonal vectors in principle. Uh, but, so, but, but, which would be corresponding to just their linear sum in, in, in that space, up to normalization divided by the normal. Yes, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I think you would norm. Like when I do research, I wouldn't think, oh, I'm taking superposition. I would, I mean, I know that the states that I have correspond to these complex uh, unit vectors and, and the ways I can manipulate them is not by take, I cannot take linear combinations of vectors. Like that's not something I can do. I can apply unitary say, or I can apply measurements. Um, so, so this is like taking a superposition is kind of like a mathematical, uh, like th th this, you're describing this linear combination, some mathematical uh, okay. uh, thing. Yeah, I, I, I don't know how, uh, if you're happy or not, uh, interpretation. Okay, <laughs> we should ask, I don't know, Bohr and other people. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I think I thought about it before. So like, I mean, like, you could always like prepare, like um, if you take a superposition, and you just consider like the projector on this superposition, like this just a vector, a unit vector, would oh, give yes. like an outcome like for a measurement, right, with certainty one. But I mean like if you have like zero one, like a superposition, you could just like you could construct a measurement, like an observable, for example, on the on I don't know, zero. And it would give you like a, it's like it would give you just like an outcome of one half with, with probability one half, right? Okay, let me just uh, say, say one more thing that you cannot superpose back states, actually, I mean, some projectors, but you can superpose state vectors, which represent up to a phase, yeah. up to an absolute complex number yeah. of numbers, one a state, this you can superpose. Except that there's a problem with superposing a normalized vector xi with another normalized vector minus xi, which is also length one if xi is normal. Okay, but that's only one thing. There is also other things, but let me stop at this moment. Okay, there are also other things about this. Um, okay, about this um, entanglement states, which when I was studying, were called not factorizable states at this moment. Now they became entangled. Okay, it's very good. But they were perfectly known also before. And my question is how to produce. I mean, if the usual quantum mechanics, so not quantum field theory, quantum mechanics can, okay, perhaps it's not the question for this particular, but let me just say it anyway. So if you want to produce a two photon state, you should produce it from some another, so for, excite them from electrons. So it requires interactions. So change the number of particles. So it requires quantum field theory, not just quantum mechanics. So probably quantum mechanics itself is not sufficient to, to analyze really profoundly on the physical grounds and mathematically the entanglement state, entangled states, but that's okay. That's just a final call. Okay. Thanks, sorry. Yeah, that's perfect, yeah, thank you. Anybody else, any? Further questions or comments? I have a question. Go ahead, Tomek. Uh, what happens uh, if instead of isomorphism, or quantum isomorphism of uh, graphs, you consider morphisms? Ha, this was my question. You stole my question. Uh, you, you mean a graph homomorphism yes, or no graph? Because uh, this isomorphism, quantum isomorphism of graphs, can be implemented by this uh, 
multiplication from the left and from the right by some mm -hmm. um, quantum permutation matrix. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so is actually- there, Is there a similar uh, presentation for uh, graph morphism or homomorphism? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not, not quantum. isomorphism. Yeah. Quantum graph, yeah. uh, quantum, quantum, uh, graph, graph quantum isomorphism, but uh, homomorphism not necessarily being an isomorphism. Exactly, yes. Uh, yes, um, so uh, luckily I can answer you because before we looked at quantum isomorphisms, we actually looked at quantum homomorphisms. Uh, but so you can you can derive some things about these strategies. For instance, you can uh, uh, you can uh, you you can show what kind of uh, entangled state is uh, sufficient, and you can uh, say something about the measurement operators and so on. But you don't get get like we you don't get as nice a structure as here. Essentially, somehow the game does not restrict. Um, you, you can come up with a game formulation of this uh, graph homomorphism, right? You, you just uh, require that uh, consistency. So if you, they get the same vertices, you, they need to respond with the same. If they get adjacent, they need to get, respond with adjacent. Right? And you have no condition on non-adjacent. Um, uh, that, that game doesn't seem to restrict the strategies tightly enough so that you would uh, get something as nice as here. And we are not aware of any concrete connection to uh, quantum groups, for instance. But how would you mathematically specify? So here you give a definition of a quantum isomorphism, yes, when you take the adjacent matrix and you, you say, yes, uh, if I can conjugate it by quantum permutation matrix, then these two graphs are quantum isomorphic. So how would you define that there exists, that there is a quantum graph homomorphism? What would be the mathematical condition? Not games, no strategies, just uh, some something more direct. Like, so, sorry, classical one or quantum? No, no, quantum, quantum. quantum. We, we don't know, we don't have such a like uh, con concise, nice uh, condition. But I can tell you, oh, there must exist uh, some operators, EGH, such that some, uh, some of these pairs of operators multiply to zero and some of them add up to identity. But I'm not able to formulate it as nicely and succinctly as here. But such a formulation exists. Some formulation in terms of matrices exists, yeah. Okay. You essentially, well, you write down um, if you can show that like uh, that, that um, it always suffices to use this maximal entangled state, then you can take any of these operators from the measurements uh, and, and enforcing that they form a perfect strategy, uh, then we'll tell you that certain, all the way back. Uh, see like, so, so we would have what, what does it mean that your strategy uh, wins with uh, success probability one? Well, certain of these probabilities need to be zero. The, one that, the ones that correspond to losing question answer pairs, right? Um, and then if, if the state here is maximally entangled, then it reduces to saying that these operators are orthogonal to each other. Mm -hmm. So this is what you get. And would that, so that's just like something like uh, if uh, the referee asks uh, G and G prime, when G and G prime are adjacent, then you have to answer with adjacent edges, something like this? Yes, yeah. And if you put here something that is non-adjacent, right? Then they have to you know, answer with non-adjacent. This has to be zero, right? So then you get that these operators would need to be, yeah. uh, uh, this product would need to be zero. <laughs> That is, is that, I mean, that isn't that also like something that uh, Priyanka Ganeshan was talking about a couple of times? Uh, I've heard her name in connection uh, to, to some, some games, but I mean, there's like a relatively large, there are many people kind of working mm -hmm. on somewhat uh, related things. So like Mike Brennan and Brianga, I think. Yeah, yeah. May I ask another question? Of course. Um, okay, so we have this uh, matrix implementation of this isomorphism of, of, of quantum isomorphism of graphs, mm -hmm. but 
can we say how different or how similar could be graphs which are not classically isomorphic, but they are quantum isomorphic? Mm -hmm. Yeah, a very nice question. Yeah, so we, we've thought about it. Um, and so what we looked at is some kind of further, so this isomorphism is a, this relation, right? This quantum isomorphism is a rel relaxation of usual isomorphism. Now, uh, what you could do is you could look at still further relaxations of this, of this relation that you can understand very well or compute easily or things like that, right? So we know a lot of properties that, uh, that, uh, that this relation must satisfy that, that we have obtained by looking <clears throat> at a further relaxation of this, okay? Um, so um, maybe you like- this one? fractional? or K equivalence or some other kind of equivalence? Um, what do you mean uh, by this relaxation? In which direction? Like, so that more graphs become related. Yes, but, but, but you uh, cited two kinds, uh, like uh, if I remember well, it was F, F equivalence and K equivalence. Mm -hmm. yeah. Is it one of these or completely different? No, uh, yet, yet, an yet another thing. Yet another, mm -hmm. thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, like a tighter kind of uh, thing than, uh, than just uh, fractional isomorphs. Uh, like for, for instance, one thing you can see already from here um, is that, um, so this matrix P is actually a unit tree, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. right? So, and, and that, uh, that tells you that, that these matrices need to be cospectral. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So only cospectral graphs can be quantum isomorphic. Mm -hmm. That already really constrains you. And we know some other uh, structural properties, like in terms of uh, walks, um, mm -hmm. counting the walks, and so on, that two graphs need to satisfy in order for them to potentially be quantum. Well, That's why you, we kind of need to go so far to these 24 vertices, I think, to, to see this difference. Uh, sorry. Mm. So maybe I could explain why I asked this uh, first, first question, because I had the impression that uh, if you construct this home from uh, planar graphs to graphs, uh, so this looks like uh, well known from category theory, Yoneda embedding of graphs into precise on planar graphs. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but it, it would be so, I, I mean, about this Lovas theorem from 67. Mm -hmm. So this is almost like Yoneda embedding, except that I don't know what, what is happening for uh, morphisms, which are not isomorphisms. So it could be, uh, said, uh, could be said something about this, what happens uh, for this uh, non quantum non-isomorphisms, mm -hmm. then, uh, all this theory could, could, could get some categorical flavor. But I, I, I'm not sure if... Yeah, I think there uh, definitely, so uh, there definitely is some kind of relation to category theory, I think. So, so what we rely on to prove it is kind of this uh, uh, combinatorial characterization of intertwiners. And these intertwiners uh, so it's a set of matrices that is closed under these, all these operations. And I think any set of matrices that is closed under this, th these operations, they form something nice, something category mm -hmm. theoretic that maybe you can tell me. Uh, it's good, yeah. uh, like, uh, I forgot now the term. So, so this is a, like, as, as soon as your set satisfies these operations, it forms something. Mm -hmm. um, can, can you spell this? Uh, I'm not aware of this uh, this embedding you were you were saying. If you have uh, any category C, then uh, you have a functor from the ca ca given category to to the category of sets, which is of the form home blank slot 
and next there's an, a given object of this category. In this way, this object can be regarded as something which is called the pre-shift, so the co contravariant functor from, from, from this category. Mm -hmm. so, so, so this looks like, like Yoneda type um, um, embedding of uh, graphs with, uh, with this uh, quantum um, homomorphisms into pre-shifts on the category of planar graphs with uh, quantum homomorphisms. Okay, but what, what is this term, Yoneda? Yo, so, yon, how yes, do you spell that? Japanese mathematician. Y. It's in the chat. Yeah, okay. and yes, so probably, <laughs> yes. Thank you, yes. Yeah. Uh, just so I can try to look it up. Uh, I don't know about uh, the, the uh, connection, but, but again, like I'm not a category theorist. So mm -hmm. I, there could totally be a connection. It's some really nice mathematics that come out of this. So I believe that it's, uh, it's not a coincidence. It's somehow part of something. Okay, thank you for the Varshi. Yeah. Don't make anything else? No, oh, thank you. Uh, so uh, anybody else before I ask my final question? Um, Richard? Uh, May I ask an additional question? Sure. Uh, could we go back to the slide with this uh, uh, state uh, uh, psi? The shared shared state? Yeah, the quantum yes, strategy? Yes, 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 for quantum strategy. Yeah. Yes, exactly this side. So I also do not quite understand the, uh, the second uh, bullet. So mm -hmm. we have... Uh, from the start, we have the family of all E, G, H, yes? And once we, and this family can be arranged in the two-dimensional matrix, yes? With the yeah. property that each entry, each uh, E, G, H is positive. And if we sum with respect to the column and uh, any row and any column, we get identity matrix, yes? And after... Well, it's not from the outset. From the outset, you only get sums along the uh, uh, along um, rows. Okay, but uh, but these uh, operators E, J, uh, H are known to Alice and Bob from the start. Yes, the collection of all these it, operators. They they choose them. This is their strategy, right? It's like. Um, if we met and we said, oh, this is the graph, I don't know, one graph is K4, the other one is some other graph and four vertices. And I say, okay, if, if I get asked vertex one, I'm gonna say vertex four, right? Or something like that. So to kind of Alice and Bob agree on the, these operators, the uh, EGH and, and these Fs, this is the strategy that they choose. This is, they, they come together and they say, this is how we're gonna play. Okay. so. Uh, the whole strategy consists from choosing a, a Hilbert space, the state, yes. and this call all uh, these operators E, J, H. And once I've got, uh, I've got- And the uh, Fs, and the Fs. And the Fs, and the yes. Fs, okay. And once I've got G, a particular G, I collect all this E, J, H with the property that uh, the sum is, uh, okay, so I'm reading uh, from this, uh, I don't know, column or the row, yes? All these operators. And I'll gather them into one uh, collection. And this is my, uh, uh, part, this is the part of my strategy, yes? Uh, so, so these operators are part of your strategy. That, that okay. an answer is yes. Okay. So, um, uh, but still, I don't see how we get this H from given G. So th there would be only one H, yes, or? No, you need to come up with it. Like you decide what it is, right? I don't know in the finite di in in the finite dimensional like that tensor product case, right? Mm -hmm. For for instance, Alice and Bob could say, okay we are going to play the strategy in C4 cross C4. Okay, right? but uh, you wrote to get H in uh, V of H. 
but below we have a, a sum over all h so uh, Uh, okay, so it, here it's the, the description of how, what happens when you do a quantum measurement, right? So kind of the black things are the description of, of how a strategy works. And the green things is the math. How do we describe this strategy in mathematics, right? So uh, what we can say is that the most general thing Alice can do when she gets her vertex G is she can perform some quantum measurement. Okay, now the result of a quantum measurement will be a classical outcome. Okay, because Alice needs to respond with a vertex from H, without loss of generality, we can assume that the measurement outcomes are indexed by H. So when she's going to do a measurement, this measurement E sub G, she will get as an outcome, as a classical outcome, this label, some vertex from H. Okay, but what is the pro procedure for getting the, this H? Well, she does some uh, uh, some beam splitters and, and depending on uh, depending on the physical interpretation. I mean, so this is kind of the formalism. Written, yes, this is not written here and uh, it is somehow involved, yes, getting this H. Uh, it depends on the particular technology that one would work with, but usually in quantum information, we don't go down to that level, right? Just like when you program a computer, you don't worry like, oh, is this like, uh, I, I don't know, you just write a quant, like you, you write a program in, in C or something and you don't worry what will be the machine on which it's going to be executed, right? Uh, so, so similarly, we know how quantum measurements work, right, uh, from, uh, from quantum mechanics. I didn't go into details about that. That's completely correct. Like, I, I did not explain that in detail. So when, you, but when you, now I'm telling you, when you do a quantum, quantum measurement, like you get as an outcome, a classical label. And the, phys the physics that happens, um, that depends on the particular uh, implementation and, and in, when we do quantum computing, we, we abstract from that. Okay, so so this is a kind of a black box, yes, how we how we get this this collection, yes. Uh, no, so okay, first of all, Alice and Bob are free to choose like when I think about these problems, I'm saying, oh Alice and Bob need to find these measurements. And what does it mean? They need to figure out what are these EGHs and Fs that will give them uh, the, uh, so that these inner products, they will evaluate to zero whenever um, this corresponds to a losing question and answer pair. So they can are free to write down whatever EGHs they want, but to win, they need to make sure that this mathematical relationship between of questions. <laughs> Thank you for the questions. I have another I have question. question about this, uh, these um, matrices or, or operators, EGH. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, they have the following property. If you if you compose uh, matrices whose entries are EGH then uh, this property of being positive definite and uh, summing up along the rows to one is uh, still holds. No, I mean, I can take two PSD matrices, multiply them together and not get a PSD matrix. It's not even Hermitian always. Oh, wait a moment. So in, in finite dimensions, right? These would ah, yes, 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 yes. But among among these matrices, you have you, you have such which uh, whose entries commute, and and, and then we'll you can iterate this. this condition. You can iterate this condition. You're detecting e squared, e cubed, and so on and so forth. Uh, so, sorry, I I I I don't understand. So okay, so I have these EGHs. Please, please imagine, please imagine a matrix. Yeah. Whose entries EGH. Okay. If the, this entries EGH uh, commute, mm -hmm. then the set of these matrices with entries EGH is closed 
with respect to composition or multiplication, mat matricial mat multiplication. Why? Uh, Any reason? You can check it. But it's supposed to be closed. You well, just have a square matrix, a square matrix yes, consisting of positive e, operators, sum of, sum of rows is one. So? So you have some uh, process. If you, if you compose this, uh, this matrix. It's not in a stochastic matrix, come on. Uh, no, but maybe. Why not? Why not? If, if, if uh, it has <laughs> scalar entries, it is. So the, you, only you... The, the, the only difference is that uh, it has uh, uh, operator uh, valued uh, entries. So it's a generalization of the stochastic matrix. So we, we have quantum a permutation matrix process. has, but. No? Uh... No, 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 no. This is a stochastic matrix. Matrix. Yeah, yeah, quantum permutation matrix. Yes. No, I, I'm no not EGHs. talking about quantum permutation matrix. I'm EGHs about... are not necessarily projections, right? And even you don't have yes. DNH. The Therefore, same, I'm uh... talking. No, no. Could, could you change the slide to come back to the previous page? I'm not talking about quantum permutation matrix. Okay. I'm talking about matrices whose entries are EGH. So this is the generalization of a stochastic metric. Mm -hmm. if, you, if, you sum, if you sum up in rows in, in H, you obtain one and, and entries are positive. If they are numbers, so this is a matrix. If you sum up you in columns, iterate. it's not one, right? Yeah. Sorry. No, 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 only, only uh, along, along uh, okay. yeah. but still you can, you can compose them. So you obtain a process, some kind of stochastic process. Okay. Okay. So this process of adjusting these uh, uh, these outcomes of, of of these players A and B to 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 this uh, to these signals from from R from the referee uh, is some kind of a stochastic process. D did somebody uh, thought? Is the thing uh, about about uh, this process in this way? Uh, I'm I'm not sure. Because the play the game is go ongoing, but no, you uh, just play one. Sorry. Like in like kind of in the usual setting, like you just play this game once. Once, so one one pair G G prime and one pair H H prime. Yes, but you are interested in the expected yeah. success probability, right? Yes. So, uh, so in this process, you can you can repeat it. And uh, taking taking the square of, of this matrix E G H, for instance, and, and and the cube, and and so on and so forth. So. So. I I mean somehow if you think about it like kind of quantumly, like of what is happening, right? When Alice and Bob perform this measurement, afterwards all the entanglement is destroyed. So, like, ah, if you so do used once, used once, this entanglement is destroyed. Yes. Okay. So, so, so the the, the game ends because of this uh, destroying of this entanglement. Okay. Well, somehow, if nice. they try to do the measurement again, right, the same measurement, mm -hmm. they would mm -hmm. get the same answer as before. Yes. Yes. It's a reduction of the quantum state. Yeah. Okay. 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 So classically, you could uh, you could uh, repeat it, repeat it, uh, but 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 quantum. It is a reduction of the quantum state, and and uh, this is the end of the game. Okay, I see. Okay, so just one question. So, performs local measurement on what state? On which vector? On the psi. On the psi, right? Okay. Yes. Uh, and right, then. So if it was a tensor product, right, then it would just be on part of the psi, mm -hmm. essentially. Like, yes, so, yeah, so control expectation. But you get another vector, right? That's what you're saying. Uh, well, there are different ways you can uh, you can think about it. Uh, you, you can think about it, the, the vector being destroyed, or you can think that uh, your result is kind of the projected vector, right? You could say that, oh, after they got these measurements, let, let, let's let's think that uh, let's let's try a more special case where where these actually are projections, not just a positive mm -hmm. projection. 
Okay, in that case, I would say that the state that Alice and Bob have, if they, so Alice measured with, uh, with her G measurement and Bob measured with his G prime measurement and yeah. they get outcomes H and H prime respectively. And I would say that the state that they have is this one up to renormalized. If for some reason this turned out to be the zero vector, then there's just no chance that they see these measurement outcomes. So it's not a problem. Okay, because my a bit of a problem is understanding problem for me. So uh, because you but uh, say Alice performs them, she receives a vector. No, no they have this no, no. Vector. She has a vector. Yeah, they have a vector, right? They have said they have this vector. Now, given G, Alice performs the measurement, but the measurement is supposed to give a discrete value. Yes, this little h. Yes, little h, right? So. Yes. Uh, this is assuming that Alice measured with G and got outcome H. This is the state that they have, oh, and Bob similarly. Richard. Um, so G, H are what? So these are just, so these are vectors, labels. right? Uh, labels the, of, no, no, but, no, Laura, my problem is you apply a vector operator to a vector, you get a vector, you don't get a label. Richard. Richard, so yeah. maybe, um, so what Alice does is like, she's, so E corresponds to one measurement, like one observable, and F corresponds to one. Uh, sorry, for every, for every G, for every little G, EG corresponds to one measurement, to one operator. Yes, but yes, so you have an operator, right? But then yeah. you apply, apply this operator to... Or a basis, a basis, like, you know, like, like uh, for example, like, uh, like uh, no, no, that, yeah, Alex. No, but the, that, that's the question. So you have your so so you you have your operator. Uh, so re upon receiving G, Alice chooses this E G, right? Yes. So when Alice and receives, then, wait, wait, and then applies this E G to this vector psi. Yes. Right. Yes. Result is a vector. And a classical label A. H. No, she's just measuring. She's just measuring. So I've, she's no measurement has no. two things that happen. That happen first is a classical label. This you always get. All right. Sometimes you can talk also about measurement giving you a post measurement state, which is now a vector. So, but one thing that every measurement always has is this classical outcome. Yeah. You, you can think that you you put your photon in and you want to me measure, oh, is it polarized this way or this other way? And then you have some device that tells you it's this, okay? This is your classical outcome. This is your label. So the e but the vector that comes out is just a vector, right? So, um, and, and so then this, this, this there's also a vector. Yeah. So, so this, but this classical outcome is kind of, uh, but it's also zero one, zero one statement, right? Mm. Your measurements can have more than two outcomes. What, what is so how do I, so how do I get the vectors? How do I get the state, right? I've got my EG. I, I'm told use G. So I'm taking my operator EG and I'm applying it to Psi and I get a vector. E G at which place do I get H? At no, no. which e place do I see H? So, so this is a this is a description of it's a probabilistic process. You you have your box, you put in your state, and probabilistically out comes this label. Oh yeah, okay. So so you so you get a label and vector. Okay, fine. Yes, yes, yes. Right, so so you have a bunch of uh, fine. Okay. So. But then how does Alice answer? Now I'm curious. She answers with that outcome that she got. No, that her outcome is a bunch of vectors, right? No, no, but she also has this label. No, no, but, but she does not get a label H, she gets She does get G. the label, no, she gets the label little H. 
So, so she gets both of them. She gets what? her age, and we don't care about her state anymore. You can assume that the box ate the photon. Yeah, yeah, true. So, no, but uh, so, so, so actually, what Alice gets is both G and H. She, she gets little G as a question, and as a result of measurement, she gets the little H, and that is what she sends back to the referee. I, again, my, the same broad question. How does that measurement goes? Because she gets for EG is is this measurement EG, which is a bunch of a bunch of operators. Yes. One operator for each age. Yes. And then you apply this bunch of operators to your to your psi. I can. So you get a bunch you. of vectors. Yes, and and. And which one do you choose? We don't choose anyone. Quantum mechanics tells us. What's going to happen if you perform this measurement that you will get each of the labels H with probabilities that correspond to the squares of the uh, yeah, sure. of the length yeah of I know the yeah so so you get yeah so it's not uh... it's a probabilistic process that's how we treat yeah okay no but what does uh, what does Alice answer the H that she got no but she didn't get H she got a vector right. No, with a sound. She got distribution, probabilistic got, distribution of H's. That's correct, yes. But this will be, I mean, when she runs the experiment, she gets a one specific H, right? I mean, just like I, no. if I, when I Why? roll a die, when I roll a die, before I roll the die, I say I get each thing with probability one sixth, it's a probability distribution. But when I actually go and roll this die, I get one of the things. Richard, I think, you know, the problem is also that like the measurement itself, like the physical measurement, you know, like in the physical sense, like not in the mathematical sense, is not really described in this formalism itself. No, and, like, yeah. you know, like, no precisely. Because, yeah. because, if you, precisely. because, what she, yeah. because the, the, the measurement operator that we're applying is the whole sum yeah. over H, and yeah. it is just one. That would give us just yeah. one. Yeah, yeah. Yes. no, no, you have just, yeah, so the answer is yes, it's not, uh, yeah. It's not a. Uh, it's not captured in this formalism. No, it's not captured. The measurements are not in this formalism. Yes. 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 Um. I have another question. Um, so. I'm um, sorry, but I will need to go soon. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. I think sorry. yeah, it's getting late. -ish. But yes. I would be happy to continue uh, the the discussion. Um, uh, definitely. If, if we arrange some time uh, and things. So just, just get, get in touch with me. I would be happy to talk. Like there's a lot of problems that I don't know how to solve. I will, I will be actually in Copenhagen it. next week. Uh, so so we can- also in Copenhagen. We can all- We're in Copenhagen, right? Actually, I am already vaccinated. So we could actually meet physically. <laughs> <laughs> At a distance, but still. Yeah, okay, yeah. we arrange something. Yes, okay. Okay, so, so in this, Thank you very in this much. case, uh, uh, Laura Maesti have my last quick question. Okay. <laughs> uh, you can answer very briefly, but it's very intriguing for me. Uh, this is not going to be some lengthy debate about quantum mechanics. Uh, and Copenhagen is famous for quantum mechanics, so actually, why not? Uh, but yeah, I'm very intrigued. You, you mentioned it in passing, uh, but uh, for me, it's very exciting. You said that something something was useful in proving uh, or actually disproving uh, the famous con embedding theorem. Could you at least very briefly elaborate on this statement? <laughs> well, it was not just useful. It's uh, literally disproved it. Um, uh -huh. um, well, it's uh, this result um, about undecidability of uh, approximating um, um, uh, the, the quantum value, uh, like what it, what it also did, it showed that there is a kind of a, um, a, a measurable gap between, mm -hmm. uh, between the set of commuting um, kind of probability distribution that you can get from commuting quantum strategies and the ones that you can get uh, using the tensor product model. And this was previously known to be equivalent to, um, to Conus embedding. To negative answer to constant Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. I think that that uh, that's enough for abusing your kindness. 
Uh, thank you very much for your patience, but these were mostly your friends from Copenhagen who abused you. So <laughs> don't blame all in for it. And, uh, but it was really lovely. I, this was a very, very nice talk. I appreciate the, all your efforts to get it through to us. And I think you noticed that it was appreciated, that, that we really enjoyed it. So thank you like, for the questions. I appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah, this is fun. This is a, a research seminar. So we are supposed to debate and not just listen. And thank you one more time uh, for your talk. Please send me the slides if it's okay with you, all right? Please send yes, me the please. Slides. Yes, uh, please. I'll, I'll send you the slides. Uh, there might be some delay. I'm, uh, we have a long weekend in Copenhagen, so we're leaving right now. Okay, okay, fine. It, it, it's, okay. it's not very urgent. As long as you send it, it's thank fine. You. I will. So thank you very much. And let me remind you that in a week, we have a talk by Sasha Gorokowski. I stopped recording. Thank you very much. I hope to see you. Thank again. you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye-bye.